Dale Tuggy, welcome to Unitarian Anabaptist. Thanks for having me, Tom. <laughs> okay, what a pleasure. Yes, I appreciate you willing to come on after a, a very strenuous weekend last weekend, last weekend debating James White, um, but you graciously agreed to do so a few days ago. So thank you mm -hmm. very much. <laughs> Thanks yes. for having me. Okay, so I, I'd like you to introduce yourself to the audience. Who is Dale Tuggy? Uh, Dale Tuggy is just a guy from Texas um, who got interested in philosophy when he was a freshman at Biola University. I ended up getting a, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD. Um, and then I was a professor for 18 years. And then I decided to get out of academia for a lot of different reasons <laughs> and uh, ended up moving to Tennessee and uh, just getting into uh, kind of a niche uh, non-academic business, but, uh, it, it ends up, uh, leaving me with room to still read and write and podcast somewhat, uh, and debate. Uh, and I also am serving as the chair of the volunteer board of the Unitarian Christian Alliance, which is something that does take a good amount of my time. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a, it's a true love. Uh, it's a real priority. Well, I'll for tell all you the what. board members, you know, we're volunteers, yes. we don't get paid, uh -huh. uh, but we're very glad to contribute our labors to this effort. Well, your love for the truth and for helping people come to the truth and to, and to get a foundation is something that is very obvious, very obvious to me and very obvious to many of those that I have come in contact with. So I thank the Lord and you for such efforts and, uh, Yes. So the, the, the arc of development that brought you to this stage, I mean, you, you just had a debate with James White. He's a big name in the Christian world of apologetics. He's debated a lot of notable people and you managed to uh, arrange, get uh, this arranged to be able to debate him and to bring, bring this message uh, of Unitarianism to a much greater audience. So uh, you've done, how many debates have you done since you've taken on this mantle? Well, I guess this would be my, you could say my third major debate. Okay. Um, you know, since I've been, I guess, you know, an internet famous Unitarian. <laughs> I, I, I did debate uh, back when I was a philosophy professor uh, one of my atheist uh, colleagues that I was friends with, I debated him, I think it was three times on the existence of God. I think the earliest one was 2002. Oh. We had a good time with that. And, you know, I kind of learned learned how to argue for being a philosophy student for 10 years. Okay. And, you know, you argue in class and sometimes you have many debates and things like this. Um, and I uh, debated, I, one of my debates with that same friend is on YouTube. Um, I can't remember the title of it. I think it's just, does God exist? Huh. Tuggy versus oh, Kirshner, okay. something like that. And that's, a, it's a pretty good debate. Um, I'm happy with the kinds of arguments that I presented there. Um, I still think I have a long way to go as a debater. Um, just because what philosophy does is it teaches you to think and to reason and to construct arguments and evaluate arguments. Okay. It doesn't really teach you all the communication skills. Um, you can be good at arguing, but be a total nerd and a bookworm <laughs> and, and okay. not really be very cut out for debating. So I'm still kind of have one foot in each of those. Games. Okay. All <laughs> right. Yes. Well, uh, I can share with you my experience. I think it goes back now four or five years ago when I was really digging into what's the right word here, uh, theology of the identity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And through the Bible project, I came to believe that Jesus was the God imager. Interesting. So, yes. So when I, when I came to that conclusion, that Jesus is the God imager. Well, if you're the God imager, then you probably can't be God, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And it was, but of course, a lot of these, a lot of these podcasts by people like Tim Mackey and so forth, they don't really come right out plainly 
and say that Jesus is not God. <laughs> He's God. Yeah. No, it's, you know? it's so interesting that you would say that, Tom. A number of people have told me, you know, I need to watch more of those episodes. I've watched some of them uh -huh. and I have noticed, yeah, that they try to get into the the worldview and the mindset of the biblical authors. Yes. And as soon as you do that, you stop being Trinitarian. Right, right. Now, they do have a really terrible episode on the Trinity. I mean, it, it I drives me insane. It's terrible. <laughs> it's using all these geometrical analogies and oh, so on. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and I, I have taken notes. I intend to do a podcast rebuttal of it. I just haven't got around wow. to it. It'd probably be best to do a video rebuttal, but I'm not, I'm not okay. much of a video guy. Uh, okay, I have a face that was made for radio, so I, I just kind of okay. prefer the audio only right. well, uh, medium. So it's, as my it, as my story goes, mm -hmm. um, I I think it was I listened to an interview with J.R. Daniel Kirk on uh -huh. the Bible Project. Yeah, and he was so interesting. And mm -hmm. then I said, you know, I wonder where else I could hear J.R. Daniel Kirk, and lo and behold. He was interviewed on the Trinity's podcast. Yeah. So I think that that's my lead to the Trinity's podcast. And once I got there, I started listening to quite a few of your episodes, mm. which are very, very deep. I guess at that time I was, you know, like ready for that, <laughs> that really deep, strenuous kind of uh, thought process. And, and I noticed that you're, you were bold enough to say things that no one else would say. So uh, the one thing I remember you saying at, at one point, it was just a comment at the end of a podcast. You, it was around Christmas, Christmas time. And you said, have an incarnation free Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, yeah. you know, there's a man who's speaking very plainly. And, and so, you know, it just kind of fit. It was the, it was the right word at the right time for me. Mm. And uh, of course it got me in a lot of trouble, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> so anyhow, yeah. um, so, so the Trinity's podcast is, so tell, maybe you can explain how did, how did the Trinity's podcast begin? Like what, at what stage were you at and, and what was your motivation? I think it was around 1998. I started kind of digging in a little bit to the recent literature by analytic philosophers on the Trinity. Uh, the first big work I read was Richard Swinburne's book called, uh, the Christian, it's so called the Christian God, I think. Okay. And he, he has a laid out Trinity theory. You know, he more or less answers all the questions. He tells you what he means by, you know, hypostasis and usia and, and so on. And, and he lays it all out. A lot of people, when they look at it, they think, oh, that's tritheism. Um, but then I, well, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what the Trinity is. Maybe, maybe it's the right kind of tritheism. I don't know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but then by, by the time it came around to the year 2000, I realized that other super smart, super serious, uh, Christians who were philosophers had made different attempts to spell out what the Trinity amounts to. And they totally clashed with one another. Okay. Um, I mean, if this one's true, the other one's false. Okay. And the other one's false. If this one's true, the other two are false. Well, there's uh -huh. more than three of them, but, um, so I just rolled up my sleeves and said, look, one of these has got to be right because the Bible implies this, doesn't it? And I think the Bible's inspired Uh huh. and but every time I, I kind of dug into them, they either had terrible theological problems or biblical problems. Ah. So theological, sometimes they end up implying tritheism, which huh? is bad. Yes. Because the Bible's monotheistic. Right. Um, sometimes they make the persons to be something like personalities, right? But then you have the personal relationship between Jesus and the Father you know, being like a guy talking to himself, uh -huh. which is, which is crazy. Yes. Um, other ones are apparently contradictory and sometimes people say it's okay. It's a mystery. It's supposed to look that way. Uh huh. That didn't seem right to me. Um, so I started to wonder about it. Um, I'd also read a famous book called the scripture doctrine of the Trinity by Samuel Clark, who was uh -huh. a leading theologian slash apologist slash Anglican minister uh, who flourished in the first, uh, about the first third of the 
1700s okay. and, and the end of the 1600s. He was a younger friend of Sir Isaac Newton, the famous physicist. In fact, he wrote like the textbook English version, or was it English or Latin? Well, he wrote like the textbook easier version of Newton's Principia Mathematica, which was a, his big scholarly work. Ah. Anyway, um, the scripture doctrine of the Trinity sounds like it's a Trinitarian book, uh -huh. um, but it's really a Unitarian book. <laughs> okay. Because he points out that in the New Testament, the one God is the Father. Uh huh. Um, he's what I now call a subordinationist Unitarian. He thinks there's the Son and Spirit are lesser divine beings, basically, that pre existed uh, eternally. But when he pointed out that the one God just is the Father, that those are one and the same, like I couldn't unsee that. Um, I didn't realize really that it was Unitarian and, and not Trinitarian. Okay. But um, it took me more years to figure that out. Um, and that drove me back to the New Testament. You know, is Clark right about that? What about pre existence? And then I learned that there were all these Unitarian. <laughs> Uh, non-Trinitarian Christians since the Reformation. And I had been trained as a philosopher to read stuff from the 16, 17, 1800s. So it was pretty oh. easy for me just to go find all this old stuff and read it. I okay. was already accustomed to that kind of reading. I see. And it was fascinating. Um, I learned that there had been all kinds of debates previously, you know, basically whenever Protestants kind of wake up and act like Protestants and are willing to reevaluate things in terms <laughs> mm -hmm. of scripture, boom, you get controversies about the Trinity yeah. uh, happening. So there were, there were several very famous ones, including one I spent a lot of time reading about in the 1690s in London. Uh, but yeah, so it drove me back to the new Testament. I found out, yes, Clark is right. The one true God and the father are one and the same. Okay. And then it took, it took me more years to figure out what I thought about uh, pre-existence for Jesus and quite what to make of the Holy Spirit. But by around, wow. I don't know, 2006 to 2009, I uh, was a biblical Unitarian pretty firmly in my conviction. Uh -huh. And when I sort of came out and let it be known to my philosopher friends that I was not a Trinitarian, um, I, I knew that was going to be super unpopular um, but I just decided to trust God with it. And, uh, I, you know, that probably led to me not being invited to things. Okay. Uh, so, so if I may ask, like that. if I may ask how many of these philosopher friends were Christians, Trinitarian Christians? Um, when I was at the school where I taught in New York state, I only had one colleague in philosophy who was a Christian that was there for a couple of years, but I knew lots of Christian philosophers, probably. I don't know, as much as a quarter of philosophy professors are Christians, something like that. Okay. Um, Catholic and Protestant. And I was a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers and was active oh. in that in the 90s and 2000s. And um, yeah, a lot, there's a lot of good people, a lot of very smart, thoughtful people who want to serve God using, you know, the things that philosophy gives you, the, the tools of critical thinking, basically. Okay. So wow. they, they write about all kinds of interesting things, divine attributes, divine providence, arguments for God's existence, what to say about arguments from evil, uh, how to think about other religions and things like that. Hmm. I have, I acquainted with lots of people who I respect a lot who are in officially, you know, Trinitarian contexts. Okay. So, so when you, at, at the point in time in which you, made this revelation that you're Unitarian, you felt some backlash at that time. Yeah. You know, I don't want to whine about it. Well, no, no, uh, I'm not asking I didn't you to get whine burned about it, at the but, stake or get well, my property seized or anything. Yeah, right, it was more right. like people rolling their eyes and, uh, not inviting me to things yeah, and yeah, talking so you, behind my bit, back. A little, little bit, a <laughs> little bit shunned, you may say, right? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit shunned. Okay. Yeah. To the extent of which you don't fully, you're not fully aware. I mean, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this was the one, uh, uh -huh. one guy, I I'm pretty convinced it was this nasty, uh, internet apologetics guy, uh, <laughs> who's no longer with us. Okay. But one guy, um, called up the society of Christian philosophers and tried to get me thrown out. Oh, really? <laughs> and I know this because one of the like board members told me later Oh. and, uh, is a Catholic guy. And he said, yeah, we kind of laughed, laughed him out of court, you know, like, <laughs> 
look, we're Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, liberal, conservative, evangelical, not Pentecostal, not like we're not going to throw this guy out because he has a different theology, right. Christology. Interesting. So, so it didn't work. <laughs> okay. So this, okay. You said this happened in what, around 2007 or so? Which oh, my, when my you, coming when you, out? You're coming, yeah, so called coming out around 2007 to nine, I want to say okay. somewhere around there. So, so and and the Trinity's podcast began in 2013. The podcast was started in 2006, oh. and I start. I called it Trinity to just to kind of highlight that there are these clashing theories oh. about what that all means. Okay. And my earliest posts were about, you know, this is what Craig says about it. This is what Peter Van Inwagen says about it. This is what Swinburne says and so on. I, I could already see at that time that this very interesting principle, deep discussion and arguments that philosophers were having were not trickling down okay. to the laity or even to the ministers in the seminaries. Oh. So I wanted this knowledge to get out there. I see. And that was kind of my aim when I started um, the Trinity's podcast in 2013, too. Um, it was always a mix of interviews and my own, you know, yeah. putting out informative kind of lectures, basically. Okay. Uh, always partly historical, partly theological, partly philosophical. Um, I, I did that every Monday for a long time, but uh, I've slowed down. It's down to about once or twice a month at okay. this point. Okay, so you were very motivated to get people thinking. And you really didn't have an end goal besides just giving people the opportunity to think about these things, right? I mean, you couldn't, yeah, foresee, basically, you couldn't I mean, foresee a Unitarian Christian Alliance at that time. <laughs> no, no, I didn't even, I hadn't ever met a Unitarian Christian no, that I knew was one. Wow. Um until I was uh, invited to Anthony Buzzard's conference. And I think that was in 2011 or 2012, one okay. of those years. And when I went to that, like I had never come across a church of God uh, from the church of God, general conference ah. or spirit and truth, spirit and truth. I might've known cause I might've bought one of their books at some point, but like I never shook hands with a with a with a Unitarian Christian until. Well, that's fascinating. I had been one for <laughs> several years. Okay, well, that's an interesting story. So, I guess you you probably know what it is to feel lonely as far as your Christian faith goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were doing house church, and it was always pretty small, and uh, we didn't beat people over the head with it. And that more than one time. People would come, oh, this is great. We love this little house church. And then yeah, eventually this would come up and sometimes they would just leave without having a single conversation. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's hurtful. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, can not we just talk about it once? Like what's, what's the problem? Yeah. But, uh, you don't All think right. Jesus is God. We're out of here. Oh we yeah. Don't know what you are. So, so I guess the, uh, you know, the last interviewer, the last interview I had was Dana Bell. You remember mm -hmm. Dana Bell? She showed up at the first conference. Yeah, yeah. And in that interview, she spoke very highly of you and the the effort that you took to make sure she could get a place there on the spur of the moment. <laughs> oh, that, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess what can be seen here is that that you have a compassion for people that were, you know, in a I mean, in a similar situation that you were in. So, uh, of course, she didn't have to wait years to find Unitarians. She just had to wait a couple months, I think, or whatever, whatever the time frame was yeah. before she came into assembly of 150 50 Unitarians there in White House, Tennessee. But uh, anyway, that's, that's very interesting that, that you, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine. Like, okay, so what is this guy doing? He becomes a Unitarian Christian. He starts this blog, then a, po well, the podcast came later. So you, the podcast started after you had met anthony buzzard right that that happened yeah a year yep. or two later year or two later yep. okay so but your your goal was still just to disseminate this kind of well to disseminate this knowledge or at least to give people something to think about in order to to wrestle with this and yeah and I mean, when i was fully convinced you know i came to the view that 
Reformation needs to go farther. Uh -huh. Why doesn't everybody believe this? Who's who's a Protestant Christian? Yeah, and um, you know, then I was looking into the history of American and uh, European Unitarian movements, and they either failed or stayed small for interesting reasons. Um, the most tragic, I think, is the American because there were a lot of Unitarians in early America, uh, the first half of the 1800s, especially. But uh, they kind of face planted of their own free will that movement. But mm -hmm. that's a big conversation. I have a couple podcasts on that. If, yeah, I think I've listened uh, to some of those. Google uh, American Unitarian Congregationalism mm -hmm. at Trinity's, and mm -hmm. you'll find those. But if if not if they hadn't failed, then I wouldn't have had to wait till my 30s to find out that there was such a thing as a Unitarian <laughs> right, Christian. Right. And yes. the, the co-chair of the UCA, uh, Keegan Chandler, he was similar. Like he was in his 20s, but he had just never known this was an option before. Yeah. No one told yeah. him. Yeah. The knowledge was not widespread. Even at the James White debate, uh, Keegan, Keegan was there sitting on the front row. He was in Houston, his hometown. Okay. And uh, Ke Keegan's a bold and brave fellow. If he hears some nonsense, he's he's likely to be the person that raises their hand and confronts it. Uh -huh. You sit on the front row, he hears somebody on the second row say something like, what's the deal with this Unitarian Universalist Dale Tuggy guy? And uh, uh -huh. he turns around and like, no, Tuggy's not a Unitarian Universalist. He's a Unitarian Christian. Uh -huh. And they're like, uh -huh. what? You know, like, they showed up to see James White. They had never heard it before. You know, there's millions of people like this. Yes. So it's changing, though, because you can Google it now and find lots of really high quality material by people like uh, Sean Finnegan mm -hmm. and uh, Keegan and, uh, and myself and others. And it will really lay out the scriptural case. You know, you you can through some just easy investigation, find out, you know, why people would dare dissent on a topic that some people consider just obviously essential. Like, right. you know, the greatest thing that Christianity ever came up with. Yes. There are yeah. good reasons, it turns out. Yes. And of course, there is there has been big pressure on Christians mm. not to look into this matter. It, it just... It, it just fascinates me, and I think this is a fact of history, isn't it? That that the Trinity was encoded in Roman law in 451 AD by Justinian, Emperor Justinian. Uh, the Code of Justinian is why we know about a lot of laws restricting religious freedom, but they actually start with the um, the 381 Council. Yes. Right mm -hmm. after that, the emperor at the time, Theodosius the first issued a decree which basically says you're going to hell and you're not a real christian unless you agree with the nicenes mm -hmm. and um then he proceeded to take away everybody else's churches <sighs> and uh as the years went on it, at first he thought he could maybe win them over with charm and good arguments but that didn't last very long and then there was a further and further clamp down on religious freedom yes and then religious freedom basically disappeared uh, in the West, uh, the former Roman empire, East and West, uh, until the Protestants reinvented it, you know, after murdering all the Anabaptists and stuff, people like John Locke and, and others were willing to rethink it. And, you know, maybe we don't have to have this coupling of church and state. Maybe we don't have to have the sword to enforce our doctrinal yeah. disputes. Yeah. And um, thank God that's that's gone. You yes. know, in the 1800s, I think in America, the Catholics finally, you know, when they were the minority, they decided religious freedom was a good thing. <laughs> and they yes. were right. So yes, I'm not criticizing yes, them, yes, you know, yes, better yes. late than never. Right, right. Um, but isn't it, isn't it a fact that the the Trinity as encoded in Roman law was something that was on the legal books for a thousand years or better? in western europe um i mean western europe didn't have one government for a thousand years so no it's going to play out differently in different kingdoms different kings and so on um but it is true that you know the official the, the popular theologians of the church going back to the time of about augustine they just simply are in favor of the state helping the church get rid of the heretics mm-hmm 
uh, if you want to read something really hair raising, um, you, you can Google the passage in Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica. This is written in the 1200s. Hmm. And he just, you know, prescribes uh, the death penalty for heretics. It's like a cancer that you have to cut out. <laughs> and yes. um, right. Well, that'll that'll shut down some thinking, won't it? <laughs> yeah. So we don't I mean, belief in, in that kind of violent persecution has largely gone by the wayside. But what hasn't is the tradition of hating heretics, uh, mm -hmm. people who disagree with the creeds. Yes. So someone commented on, on a video of, the, I think it was the video of the debate, and they said, I wish I could live in a world where guys like this are thrown in prison. Yeah. Uh, or no, did he say executed? One, oh, of, wow. one or both, I forget. Wow. But yeah, so the, the there's still... Uh, there are still people out there who think it's okay to hate your fellow Christian if they're not Nicene. Mm -hmm. That tradition that goes back to Athanasius and company has not died out, unfortunately. Yes, unfortunately, but I, I yes. would hasten to say that not all Trinitarians are like that. Some of them are tolerant and just want to have a friendly argument, and yes, they're they're intellectually humble and so on. They're, people run the whole range, you know. Mm -hmm. So yes. So what I guess what I'm interested I'd like to talk about the de the debate the mm -hmm. debate that you had recently but can you give me give the audience an idea how what's 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 the the trajectory that like the arc that brought you to this debate with James White you said you've done three high profile debates so you were doing the the Trinity's podcast and then like at one point did you decide I want to do some debates I want to like bring bring this material into that kind of a arena or how, how did that, how did that come about? Like, how do you go from being a podcaster to a debater? I, I guess I must've started thinking about debating this topic when I viewed some previous debates by Sean Finnegan. He did a very good one with a guy named Brant Bosserman. Uh, I once kind of commented, uh, provided commentary on an online written debate between a Christadelphian and an evangelical Trinitarian. I thought that was very interesting. And then there was a debate between Anthony Buzzard and a guy that was just assigned to him at the last minute and Michael Brown and oh. James White that's uh -huh. on the internet. And yes, a lot of people have said they found it helpful. It, it helped them to think uh, and question uh, the status quo. And okay. Sir Anthony comes off as as the gentleman that he is. Uh, but honestly, it's a horrendously bad debate because um, the Trinitarians are just heaping contempt on the other guys. They were assigned together. Anthony didn't even know the guy. And oh, the other guy was okay. terrible. Uh, the good, good guy. The, yeah. His name was good. He had, a, he had the yarmulke Yama, on. Yeah, yeah, yarmulke. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> So okay. it, it was a really terrible so you debate could, you, you on the whole. You kind of pictured yourself and, you know, involved in the such host a thing. The hosts would put up verses you, whenever the Trinitarians talk, but then it would mm -hmm. just be a blank when the Unitarians talk. So I wanted there to be something better. My first two debates were actually set up by uh, a ministry uh, that Tracy Zykovich is involved with. Um, and she's uh, a friend of Anthony and is in his circles. And it was really by her initiative that she was able to set up uh, Michael Brown oh. and then uh, Chris Date eventually. Um, then this this one, uh, I challenged James White to a debate way back in 2017. And I thought, you know, this guy's considered an expert on the topic because he wrote that book, The Forgotten Trinity. Mm -hmm. But his own views on the Trinity don't don't really make a lot of sense. And I think we should debate the Trinity. Um, I was roughly shot down or actually Tracy was, uh, when she approached his ministry oh. and I could tell James White just thought I would, he, he really didn't like me. Okay. Um, partly my personality, partly being a philosopher. Uh huh. Um, just that I'm out there saying, Hey, you know, First of all, your views don't make a lot of sense and you don't understand identity statements. Uh, but second of all, there's all these competing Trinity theories. Like he just found this very annoying. 
And uh, I don't know, something changed. And maybe he just thought, hey, this guy's getting too big for his britches. Oh. I, need to, I need to show him I can show everybody I can beat him or something. Okay. Um, but I was approached by the pastor, Evan McClanahan, of the First Lutheran Church. Uh, I think it was last summer uh, in Houston. And he said, hey, uh, would you be interested in this? I, I assume he initiated it. Uh, and the white camp said yes. So there we there we go. So so it wasn't it wasn't initiated by the white camp. It was initiated by. I don't this... think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, but maybe because it came from the the um, question or the the idea came from someone other than your circle, it may have been considered a little bit more seriously. Maybe. I mean, he was also doing this major debate tour. I, I think within the space of a month, he debated about four or five people. Okay. Uh, so he was kind of on a tear. I see. And, uh, you know, my strategy didn't work. Um, even though I gave him my stuff a month ahead of time, in his rebuttal, he really didn't address it at all. Oh. And um, partly I, that's a matter of prep time. You know, I spent that whole month figuring out how to address almost all the things he said in exactly 10 minutes, which is very, okay. very hard for uh -huh. it to be relevant and well, well argued. Yes. Um, he just saw my slides and I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, I think it was unfamiliar and I think he might've made a mistake in how he evaluated my arguments. So my main, the, the main thrust of my opening statement is there are nine classes of facts and each one of these would be very surprising if the authors think Jesus is fully divine. Um, but those facts would be expected or at least not very surprising if they think Jesus is a man. Mm -hmm. So it's a way without begging the question to compare two hypotheses. One is the New Testament authors think Jesus is a man, period. Uh -huh. And then they think he's a man, but also God or God man, or as James White says that he's Yahweh. Um, and J you know, James White has relentlessly pushed the line, you know, whenever he interacts with any non-Trinitarians, he's just like, you're assuming Unitarianism over and over. It's like a drumbeat. So in part, I picked this style of argument because it just ah. obviously doesn't assume Unitarianism. Okay. Right. It's like, what if you guys are right? What if we're right? Right. So I'm not assuming either one. We're, okay. we're looking at the evidence and seeing if the evidence favors one or the other. And it does. <laughs> um, now, I suspect James White might have made a mistake um, in thinking about this. I don't know this for sure. Could just be he just thought this was going to be easy and just didn't want to spend the time to prepare. But um, if you just say to yourself, Jesus is a man, well, we think Jesus is a man. And all the facts you uh, are citing are logically consistent with Jesus being a God man. Okay. Now, those facts are logically consistent with Jesus being a God man. So, um, at least they arguably are. So, you know, one of them is all four gospels feature mere man compatible main theses. In other words, when they give you their main hypo, their main thesis statement, uh -huh. it just says he's God's Messiah and the son of God. That's it. There's no yes. God man part. Uh -huh. There's no fully divine part. Yes. That fact is logically consistent with, oh, but they really think he's a God man. Like maybe they just keep decide to keep it on the down low for some reason, right? Uh huh. All the facts are arguably consistent with the authors thinking that he's a god man. But if you stop there, right? So I think he might have just been like, no duh, like this doesn't prove anything. Um, and plus we say he's a man anyway. This is entirely missing the point. Okay, it's entirely missing the point. This style of argument has to do with probabilities. And remember, I explained, um, I explained it using two uh, an mm -hmm. analogous situations. Yes. And one of them was uh, they got a dead body and they got this guy who they suspect might be the killer. Mm -hmm. And they find his DNA on the body. Yes. Now, 
if you just say, well, look, his DNA being on the body is consistent with him being innocent. It is. It's logically consistent, right? Like maybe a cop stole his DNA and put it there. For right, instance. right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, or maybe, I don't know, they bumped into each other on the way to her getting murdered or something. You know, uh -huh. you can come up with 10,000 scenarios, but it is consistent with, logically consistent with his innocence. Okay. But the thing is, you don't stop there. It's, it'd be very surprising if he were innocent and his DNA was where it was. Um, and it's expected that it would be there if he's guilty. And mm -hmm. so as concerns those two hypotheses, this evidence favors guilty over innocent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this could all be overturned, right? Maybe they catch the cop red handed putting DNA everywhere, you uh -huh. know? Yeah. This kind of evidence can always be overturned if you find further evidence or if you put it in a wider context and okay, things like yes. that. But then again, when these kind of considerations start to pile up, right. there's a lot of things that would be surprising if he were innocent, mm -hmm. um, but expected if he were guilty. Like, you know, maybe the way he acted afterwards or, um, you know, that he had certain defensive wounds on his face. You know, people fight back when they're getting killed. Once they start piling up, then all of a sudden you have like a rock solid death penalty case here. Yes. Like that's how we're, that's how sure we are of this type of reasoning. So this is a part of what philosophers and scientists call inference to the best explanation where you, there's mul multiple explanations that are out there. Uh, if true, they would explain the observations, but then there are different considerations that make you say, well, but this seems like it's the best of the bunch. So, so it's, when you chose nine, nine yeah. proofs, what you're doing there is you're piling up the evidence. Is that what's going on here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I picked nine. I, I had, I think I had 15 or 16 at one point, <laughs> but I just knew I couldn't fit them in. I see. Um, I spent a lot of time, uh, something maybe providential happened during the debate we were told and it was actually printed on the program that we had 20 minutes for the opening. Oh, and I regretted that for months. I was, how am I, I going to fit in all I want to say oh, in wow. 20 minutes? That's uh -huh. not much time for a yeah. former philosophy professor. Right. So we, when James White got up there to open the pastor says, okay, you got 25 minutes. Go. Oh. I'm like, did I hear that? Right. <laughs> 25 minutes. Okay. Cause I mean, I had it like timed out. Like oh. I could barely just get it into wow. 20 minutes. Right. Yeah. So I make sure I heard it right. I asked him before I went up, he could probably yes. see on the video. I'm like, uh, pastor, is, is it 25? He says, yes, you got 25. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I took my foot off the gas pedal okay. and Isn't that went something? at a better pace wow. and gave uh, an extra example or two. And I think it helped, it helped to make it better. Yes. So, well, I thought the opening was beautiful and it was, yeah. it seemed to me that you were very well poised and just, I mean, it just, it was, it was just, it was in the right measure. It was, I, I noticed too, like the difference between you and James White is James White is some, some oftentimes trying to dictate how the debate is going to go, or this is what yeah. you have to prove. There was none of that on your part. You got up there in a very calm manner, laid out the, the logic, the reasoning, and I thought it was very, very well thought out. So it wasn't, it was something that you were very prepared for, obviously. I spent months preparing for it, but honestly, I was well prayed up too. There were people praying for mm -hmm. me and that helped me to settle down once I got into the room. Yeah. Um, another thing I think might have tripped him and some of his fans up listening to my opening was the, okay, the last, I think it's about quarter or third of it, I talk about that the God man, that seems to be the concept of an impossible thing because it implies contradictions, uh -huh. right? Now they know I don't believe in incarnation. Yes. And so it's tempting to just go, oh, here we go with the assuming again. Look, look ah. at this fool assuming yes. that it's impossible. How yes. can you assume that it's impossible when the Bible says it actually happened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so then they just don't have to think about that. Right. Um, they just ignore you know, that's a good excuse to totally ignore it. <laughs> yes. Big mistake. Okay. There's two, there's really two things going on in that part. And I could have explained this better. I think 
one one thing is when you're interpreting any source, even if I'm interpreting a letter from Tom, I try to interpret it as self-consistent. I try to avoid contradictory interpretations. So if you send me a, I don't know, a little postcard, you say, hey, how's it going, Dale? I haven't seen you in a while. A um, lot happening here. I'm worried, but I'm not. Okay. I am not going to interpret Tom as saying, I am worried. And in the same sense that I just mentioned before, I'm also not worried. Uh -huh. Right. Because then you would be an idiot. Like, how would you, what would be wrong with you that you would assert something and then deny the very same thing, right? You know, in the second yes. half of the sentence or in the next sentence. Uh huh. So I'm going to, I'm going to make a distinction. I'll say, oh, he must mean that like, I'm a little bit worried, but not a lot worried or something like okay. that. Yeah. So philosophers call this interpreting charitably or the, the principle okay. of charity okay. even gets discussed. Uh huh. So the new, when you come to the new Testament, the more you respect these authors and all the more so when you believe they're inspired, you can't go around attributing contradictions to them. That should be an absolute last resort. Um, so that's one point charity. Another point is if your Christology implies contradictions, then just logically speaking, it's false. You can't have a bunch of all truths yeah. that imply some falsehoods. If you, if you start with truths, any, any inferences are only going to also be truths, right? But every contradiction is false. Contradiction is of the form P and not P. You're just asserting and denying the very same thing. Uh -huh. um, so if you're, if your theory and this, this works in sciences and in any field, just as much as it works in theology, if your theory implies a contradiction, there's at least one falsehood in it and you need to hopefully fix that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then I laid out, look, you, it looks like you've got all these contradictions. Um, and it seemed to me when I read James White's book that he really just avoided this entirely. He just doesn't even, uh, mention a lot of divine attributes such as being uncreated that would seem to conflict with being a real human being. Uh, even his position on omniscience is, I just listened back to that part cause I was editing the audio for my podcast and uh, you know, did G did did Jesus know the day or hour? And he says no. Did ya did did Yahweh know the day or hour? He says, well, yeah, yeah, he always knew that. The Father always knew that. Okay, so if the Father knows everything, and this is because he's divine, then omniscience or knowing everything is a divine attribute, uh -huh. right? Yes. And so if Jesus is fully divine, you can't lose divine attributes, uh, essential divine attributes. I mean. Just yes. by definition, you can't still exist and lose an essential attribute of any kind. That just follows from the concept of an essential attribute. Essential attribute is some feature that you have to have so long as you exist. Um, so how can Jesus be fully divine, which entails essential omniscience and yet not know the day or the hour? And I think he's just like, um, incarnation, Oh, it's like hiding his glory. Look, are you denying that that omniscience is an essential divine attribute? Because that's uh, the only way out. Given that you've put your stake in, I, I'm not going to deny that Jesus is fully divine. <laughs> you have to deny that knowing everything is a divine attribute. But he doesn't. He doesn't see that for some reason. Isn't there a convenient term called kenosis that is oftentimes used yes. in such a case? Yeah. So. Yeah, there's an interesting story there too. So, I mean, he could have appealed to kenosis, couldn't he? Yeah, he kind of does, but I think he doesn't understand the point of kenosis. Okay. So, you know, traditionally, a lot of the church fathers they just took the view that, um, well, Jesus really did know the day and hour. Uh, he was just telling you that he wasn't authorized to say it or something oh. like that. Okay. Like when Paul says, I only, I only knew among you Christ crucified. Well, it wasn't the only thing that Paul knew, right? But what he was saying is he, that was the only thing he was authorized to preach. Oh. Um, so a lot of them thought that Jesus really did know it because he was divine. And he just said he didn't for some reason. And um, in the 1800s, a broad swath of theologians in, in various countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and Germany, 
they started to think, look, the Jesus of the Gospels, he really has to be a human with limitations similar to ours. Um, he can't really be walking around omniscient and omnipotent and so on. Uh-huh. And that was when they coined the term kenosis. Oh. Um, it's from the ekenosin, the verb in Philippians 2, when it says he emptied himself. Okay. So, okay, but what's going on? You can't, by definition, you can't empty yourself of an essential attribute and still exist. Oh. Um, so it's not clear that it helps with incarnation theory. And also, as Dr. Timothy Paul has pointed out in his first book about incarnation, it's incompatible with the tradition. So the two natures uh, theories going back to Chalcedon in 451 they say words to the effect that the properties included in each of the natures are unchanged. All right. So you can't mm -hmm. divinity still implies knowing everything before and after uh -huh. uh, it doesn't do anything to change what's implied by divinity. So yeah, kenosis doesn't, doesn't seem to work, but he kind of gestured in that direction. Okay. Um, but I don't know why he thinks kenosis could help. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a real lack of concern with contradictions, but I think the truth seeker has to be concerned about them. Um, I think he's so confident of his deductions, right? The, the kind of reasoning that he, that he does, it's kind of the only kind of reasoning that he does in this context. He's got, He's got the New Testament and he's got uh, some points about language and mm -hmm. he wants to show that somehow, even though it's not explicit, it's all implicit. All the orthodox conclusions are implicit there. They're all implied. And so he's going to point out various features of the text, make a couple points about the Greek and say, see, it implies exactly what we're saying. Right. And the, the things I'm doing are not that. I'm doing various kinds of argument. Mm -hmm. And I also think something I did in my rebuttal went over a lot of people's heads too, but, uh, what was that? It was when I remember when I flashed the image of the conspiracy theory guy, like writing stuff on a board. Um, so, you know, he looks at first Peter three and he finds some Greek words that are in common with the Septuagint translation of a passage in Isaiah. Oh, I remember that. Yes. And he's like, see the Isaiah passages about Yahweh. And so see the same Greek words. Mm -hmm. um, this passage must be about Yahweh too, but no, it's about Jesus Yes, in distinction from Yahweh. So what I did, I did something that philosophers do. And I didn't remember that ordinary people don't do this so often. Okay. So, <laughs> but philosophers do it all the time. Uh, -huh. uh so you have an argument, premises and a conclusion, and if the premises imply the truth of the conclusion, that's called a valid argument. So the, the traditional medieval example is all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. If it's true that all men are mortal, it's not true anymore, actually, but never mind that. <laughs> uh, if it's true that all men are mortal, if, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and if it's true that Socrates is a man, that logically implies that Socrates is mortal, right? Right. So that's a valid deductive argument. Uh -huh. um, if you want to show that an argument is invalid, to, right, to be invalid is the premises could be true and the conclusion could still be false. Okay. So the premises don't, don't imply or don't support the conclusion. So what philosophers will do sometimes to, to help people to see how an argument is invalid, they'll give a similar argument that everybody recognizes doesn't work um, where the premises don't support the conclusion to illustrate the invalidity of the, uh, the argument that we started with. So we'll give, we'll give a parody argument. Uh, like if you think that reasoning works, then this reasoning over here would work, but everybody knows this reasoning over here doesn't work, but it's of the same form as the argument that we started with. So it's a way to show that an argument is invalid uh, with a parallel argument. Right. So, and I think I stole this example from actually the great, um, American Unitarian Harvard scholar, Andrews Norton, I believe it's in his 
book where he argues against the Trinity. So if you look at first Peter two, nine, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. There are uh, six words that are the, the same in Greek and they're even in the same order from Exodus 19, six, okay. where it says about the Israelites and you shall be for me a royal priesthood and a yes. royal nation. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So the similar, the similar argument would be since Peter's using s some of the same oh, yeah. words in the same yep. order, yes. he must be saying that the Christians he's talking to <laughs> are the same people yes. as the Jews of the time of the Exodus. Right. I remember that argu which, argument, which, which is made. ridiculous. Yeah. I thought right? that was everybody very knows good. it's ridiculous. Yes. Okay. But then James White's argument is ridiculous too. Um, but that went by so fast. So I've seen a lot of comments online, like just, they thought, I, I don't know what they thought I was saying, but they're just making like irrelevant comments about this. Um, like what, you know, what's that guy thinking? Like, like as if I was arguing that those were the same people, for instance. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> the, that wasn't the, the case. Whole point is the argument it. fails. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, anyone who wanted to really take care to understand that debate needs to listen to it more than once because the first time That's around a lot of decent debates. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It needs to be listened to more than once. So, so actually what you, what you observe in the new Testament is that the new Testament authors can be tapping into kind of thought patterns and word patterns of the old Testament, because probably they're, you know, they're very familiar with the old Testament. That's kind of the way they think, right? Yeah. So it can come out without it actually being that exact same thing, or, you know, it's just, it's just a, um, oh, what's, I think that happens in Revelation extremely often where that. Yeah. And so, you know, they didn't have quotation marks back then and there's kind of a gradation. Sometimes they'll say, you know, as it's written and then they, they'll use the same exact words as the Septuagint translation. So there are their when we translate, we put the quotation marks in and that's okay. correct. Okay. Cause they are meaning to quote, but a lot of times, you know, if you say something like we, the people, you know, in an American context, uh -huh. like you just kind of recycle a lot of phrases. Yes. Um, you know, do it with Shakespeare. You know, that guy was hoist by his own petard, which means exploded by your own grenade. Oh. Um, <laughs> they do that a lot too. And philo uh, scholars will call it um, referencing it or gesturing at it or echoing the words okay. and so on. Uh -huh. um, and White seems to read these passages, honestly, with kind of conspiracy theory eyes. He's like, see, they took this original thing about Yahweh and they uh, quoted about Jesus. And what else could their point be but that yeah. Yahweh and Jesus are one and the same? So I think and this is a yeah extremely important it, important detail here that we shouldn't just think in terms of oh the words are the same therefore the concept is the same right mm -hmm. yeah and it's a well known fact by all biblical scholars that the New Testament authors use the Old Testament in some surprising ways and it's very clear that sometimes they think there is a second meaning and a second fulfillment of a text. Mm -hmm. This happens very often. And sometimes it's really obvious. So like in Matthew, uh, the author quotes something, I think it's from Hosea out of Egypt. I have called my son. Mm -hmm. And when you go look up that passage, it's talking about like the Jews. Yes. So we know he's not saying the Jews and Christ are one of the same. Right. Right. He thinks, you know, that probably not known to the prophet, uh, but known to God, that there was another meaning and another fulfillment waiting for that. Um, that's how the Psalms are that are applied to Jesus, like Psalm 110, 1 uh, and Psalm 45. They're originally about Israelite kings. Um, 110 is a coronation song, mm -hmm. and Psalm 45 is a wedding occasion, as becomes clear when you read down farther. Okay. But yes. the authors of the New Testament believe there is a meaning an extra meaning that has to do with Jesus. And this is just a fact about how um, the New Testament uses the Old Testament. Uh, an even more parallel one would be when Matthew mentions the prophecy in, I, I believe it's Isaiah 7, about the child to be born called Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you go back and look that up in Isaiah, it was clearly a child to be born around that time during the reign of, of a certain king. Yes. Um, and things are said later that make you think this has happened. Um, now, Matthew is not telling you that that baby and Jesus are the same. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely not his point. And nobody takes it that way. Now, I remember, in, I think in one debate, I brought this up. And uh, the person I was debating actually just denied that it was about anybody but Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, good luck with that yes. argument. You yes. can just read it there. Yes. Um, so yeah. I, I call this the fulfillment fallacy. An Old Testament text is about someone. The New, text, New Testament author says that uh, it's fulfilled in Jesus. Um, and so therefore the original subject and Jesus are one and the same. It's just, it's just wrong. It's like a beginner's mistake in reading the New Testament, really. So is that, I don't know why James White thinks it's so obvious convincing. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I really so, don't. So would you call that kind of like repurposing that, that passage? Is that, is that how it would be described or is there a better way to describe that? You can, you know, you can repurpose anything. Uh, you can just steal famous phrases and sentences and, and use them for, you know, something that the original author that never entered their mind. Mm -hmm. Right. But this is scripture we're talking about. So I think they believe that God oversees its writing, even though it's really written by people, by humans, still God knows what he's doing with it. And because God is kind of the farthest back author, uh, he can have more in mind than the human author had okay. in mind okay. uh, when he's inspiring it. So I think they are, they are uh, discovering things that were there all along. I remember uh, Jesus, when he appeared between his resurrection and ascension, sat the disciples down and taught them about the predictions about him that are in the Psalms and the prophets. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that this is part of what he was telling them. Well, Jesus um, sees himself in those Psalms. He, yeah. 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 So, and of course, in the light of the resurrection of Jesus, the, the, the followers of Jesus are going to be looking at the old Testament in a very different way, aren't they? So this is kind of a, I don't know how you, how you say like, they're this is, looking at this it. Is projecting yes. The resurrection projected backwards maybe, or how would you describe that? Well, they're, lo they're looking at the Old Testament as ultimately leading up to Jesus. Like this was always part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not all the Jews even have believed in a Messiah. Uh, and the ones that did, a lot of them rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So, yeah, they're definitely looking at it differently. And in a way, they're prioritizing the New Testament and using that to understand the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and they believe it's a later and greater revelation. Yes. Which I think that's right. That Theologians call that progressive revelation. Um, humankind, as it goes along, is arguably ready for various things at various times. You know, that's why in, uh, you know, Jesus says that Moses allowed divorce because of your hardness of heart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why didn't uh, Paul try to get rid of slavery? Yeah, I don't know. It was it was pretty much universal in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he chose to do instead was instruct Christians on uh, how masters should treat slaves and vice versa. Sure. Uh, but, you know, everybody knows it's better that we've gotten rid of it. It was yes. really Christians leading the charge in Britain and America. Uh, so, yeah, we think... Revelation is progressive. I think all Christians have thought that really. Okay. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, so I did, I did want you to mention something about the, the UCA as well. Yeah. So you are the president of the UCA, but chair it, of the board. Yeah. 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 Chair of the board. Okay. And uh, so, so like we talked about your, your arc of doing podcast or, you know, blogs, podcast, how you're doing debates. How, how has the Unitarian Christian Alliance developed to the stage where it's at today? Well, 
It was born out of discussions with people, including uh, Sean Finnegan and Keegan Chandler and Brandon Duke. Uh, we realized that the various kinds of Unitarian Christians were really not at all unified. And, uh, you know, we, we tend to be stubborn, uh, independent minded people. And there's always the more conservative people in a denomination or a ministry or a church. And sometimes the more conservative, you know, they wouldn't want to have this guy over here preach in their church because they disagree about speaking in tongues or quite how to understand the end times or <laughs> a different view about women in ministry and all kinds of things. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so we realized that this disunity, these groups just kind of get used to being small and just kind of try to survive. Mm -hmm. And we were like, no, we, we don't want to be just small and survive. We want to bring about wide scale reformation. We think all Christians should think this way. Um, so it has a twofold mission. One is to promote Unitarian Christian theology and understanding of the Bible. And one is to help to bring together Unitarian Christians. Okay. So on the individual level, people will study this and then they live in, you know, I don't know, the middle of nowhere in Nebraska. And they just simply literally don't know any other Unitarian Christians. So people will get a free membership with the UCA and it'll put a little dot on their zip code. And then other people in Nebraska, you, they can see where this dot is and they can message them and so on without revealing their email uh, or their real name if they, if they want it that way. So we did this to, uh, so people would be encouraged and not just fall out of fellowship. And so that new churches and Bible studies and online fellowships could result. And so that people could find the churches that are there because uh -huh. there are churches and home fellowships and yes. online ministries. So we wanted them to be able to, uh, we, we want to network Unitarian Christians in that way and find whatever theological preferences they have, you know, um, find, we, we hope they can find like-minded people. We don't want to tell them how to decide all the other issues. Okay. Yeah. Um, now <laughs> at the, at the larger level, you know, this group over here doesn't want to have anybody from this group speak because they disagree about things by having these conferences. It creates kind of a neutral space where everybody knows you're there just because you believe the one God is the father and that Jesus is his human Messiah, the son of God. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not presupposed that you will agree with all those other guys. So because it's not run by those groups yes. and because we are not a denomination or a church, we're not competing with any of those. We don't have churches. Uh -huh. So we're just a parachurch ministry and nonprofit that wants to serve the individuals and the churches. We want to help people find them. We want to help them um, help one another. And uh, it's really been beautiful just to sit back and look at the friendships uh, and the collaboration that have resulted. Uh, there were a couple of guys at the last conference who there was some backstory about that they had had some disagreements. And I didn't know what was going to happen when they came to the conference. Uh -huh. And what happened, I saw they went up and gave each other a big hug. <laughs> and the other groups I found out, you know, they're, they're talking about working together in terms of missions and other uh, online fellowships and things like that. So Interesting. that's just a real blessing to see people, you know, they still have disagreements and that's, that's fine. You know, we just have to live with that as Christians mm -hmm. and the Trinitarians have done that. Honestly, if you look at the evangelical coalition, they've managed to subordinate. Uh, they've got people that baptize babies. They've got people with all the views about women in ministry that you could have. They've got different views about Calvinism and how grace works and things like that, but they've created this shared identity so that if an evangelical moves to a new state, they just kind of try to find the evangelical church. They're not even so much caring whether it's Baptist or Methodist or whatever. Um, so we want there to be a Unitarian Christian brand that's understood to be Bible oriented. That We want to follow Jesus in his teachings and in his commands uh, and, and worship God through him, um, that, that people can have as a shared identity 
even while they also are a member of this church or this ministry. And, you know, hopefully as we build more of a shared identity, we'll be able to have more friendly arguments, you know, usually mm -hmm. behind the scenes about all of these things. Sure. Absolutely. You know, you would think that if we could all just get together, the stronger positions hopefully would come out uh, at some point and the disagreement might be lessened um, just by mutual truth seeking. So yeah, that's what the UCA is. We are super excited about 2024 in July. We're putting on our first conference overseas mm -hmm. with the help of a wonderful committee of uh, all British people, I think, and one German. Wow. Um, it's going to be in Windsor where the Windsor castle is near London. Oh, wow. Uh, and we're super excited about that. There are a lot of wonderful believers in the UK, many of them Christadelphians, yes. but not all. And then we have another conference that's going to be in Arkansas near Little Rock in October. We picked that because there's a beautiful retreat center where we can eat and have our meetings and sleep all in the same facility. And, you know, we think Arkansas will be nice that time of year. So we're really, really looking forward to that. And, um, have been really encouraged by the feedback that we've gotten. We've, we've done a little bit better each time. I think thanks to people's honest critiques and suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And your and, willingness, uh, it's to, really been a lifeline yeah. for a lot of people. Yes. And uh, yeah. And your willingness to take those suggestions. <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate that. It's that's appreciated as well. How, what's the capacity of the people that can attend the Arkansas uh, retreat? I'm not terribly clear about that. I think the accommodations might max out somewhere around, I want to say 200. 200, okay. Something like that. Um, it's between 150 and 200, I think. Don't quote me on that though. And the place in the UK, I think we have meeting room in the, in the main room for 150. Oh, wow, okay. And there we'll just be in hotels nearby uh -huh. in Windsor. So but, um, what was the attendance at the last UCA conference? It was around 200, wasn't it? Or a little bit more than 200? I don't remember the exact number. I want to say it was something like 185 okay. registrations, but then some people don't show up, like maybe 10 or a dozen for some reason just end um, up not coming. Okay. But it, was, it was well over 150. Uh, and we were just delighted with the, the host church. That is yes. just the nicest host oh, church. Yes. And the pastor, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Kane is totally on board. I mean, we would kind of like to do it there every year, but we just want, felt like we needed to move it around for the sake of people who couldn't get to Ohio. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it kind of closer to, you know, the big metropolis of Dallas, Fort Worth and okay. other places in Texas, places in Texas and maybe, Colorado, Kansas, uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. Um, maybe sometime we'll go even farther west, maybe do it out in California or Oregon or something like that. I don't okay. know. Okay. Nice. God willing. Yes. We, th we think there needs to be more of them. Uh, as a nonprofit, we don't have a single employee right now. <laughs> It'd be nicer if we did have a person who could kind of take calls and send out swag and, uh, you know, work on conferences just all year and, and do, <laughs> do several yes. a year. Uh -huh. There's also been some discussion of one in New Zealand Wow, that could possibly happen this year. There's a young fellow there who there's some interest and we think a few, few people would come over from Australia, hop on a flight and come down. So, I mean, wouldn't that be exciting? Yes, it would. Yes. Okay. Well, I think we've gone over our time. Uh, <laughs> so time flies when yeah, you're having the fun, as they yes, say. Yes, it certainly does. Well, I think that was a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful discussion. And uh, I, I thank you again for taking the time to come on. And I, uh, I guess I would like to congratulate you for a very well done debate. I hope that this interview spurs people on to listen to it. I think it's worth deep consideration. So May God Thanks, bless you, Tom. Brother Dale, and thank your you. work. And uh, thank you for putting your, pouring your heart into this this good cause. So Thank you. Okay. And I, I would just advise people, if they haven't seen the debate yet, or if they've dipped a toe in and didn't watch the whole thing, 
make sure you go to the Unitarian Christian Alliance YouTube channel and get that version. That one has had the audio and video vastly improved over the live stream. So that's the one you want. You'll actually be able to read all my slides and hear things clearly there. Th thanks to the heroic okay. efforts of board members, Mark Kane and Brandon Duke. Okay. Very good. Okay. So. Well, I will bid you good night and God's blessing. Mm -hmm.